The fifth installment of the Evil Dead franchise, Evil Dead Rise, is a bloody good time and won't disappoint horror fans. Hello, movie friends. Welcome back to Raiders of the Lost podcast. We just saw Evil Dead Rise, and we had an absolute blast. This gore fest was a good time. Actually had some good humor as well. Lee Cronin came in to direct the fifth installment of Evil Dead Rise, and it is getting great reviews from critics and audiences alike. Yeah, we had a little screening with a bunch of Raiders fans. We had like 15 people came out, so everyone oh, yeah. who came out, if you drove or flew or whatever, we appreciate you so much. We're definitely going to do some more like public screenings, get a bunch of people together to go see a movie maybe this summer with Oppenheimer. But we all enjoyed Evil Dead Rise, Rotten Tomatoes right now. As of recording, it is an 84% fresh score critically on Rotten Tomatoes and 80% audience score. IMDb, it is a 7.4. Metacritic, it is in 68%. And it grossed, what was it, 25, 30 million dollars? 23 op- million. 23 yeah. million dollars. It's opening weekend, which is really solid for a rated R horror film. And the budget wasn't that huge on this. Yeah, I think that's already more than its budget. And what really I think set, set this film apart from any of the others in the franchise was the acting. Jane Levy did a great job in the last film, but I think the the ensemble nature of the cast, these actresses did a phenomenal job. I was blown away. Even the the young girl, the two older actors, they really just like carried it on their shoulders and their performances made the film work. Uh, I thought that the acting just was phenomenal. Phenomenal! Phenomenal! So much emotion. Probably the most impressed by all of the performances, I would say. Yeah, on a budget of twelve million, it has so far grossed forty million globally, and that's it's been released for like what ten days or something like that. Now, this, star- this film stars Alyssa Sutherland, who was phenomenal in this movie. Reminds me of like great horror performances recently, like Tony Collette and Hereditary. Alyssa Sutherland was terrific in this film, terrifying but also loving. Before she was possessed <laughs> by the demon, also stars. Marabi Pe- Pe- uh, Peace, Richard Crouchley, Lily Sullivan, Anne Marie Thomas, Noah Powell, Morgan Davies, Gabrielle Eccles, and Nell Fisher. Everyone did a great job. Child performances from child performance performance from N- Neil Fisher was she was great. Nell Fisher, she, I'm sorry, she was she broke Terrific. my heart. Terrific, yeah, goodness, she's so cute. But overall, yeah, like you said, everyone did a really great job in these roles. So bloody, I enjoyed the hell of it. I think it also has. The best opening title credit role or title role sequence I've seen since the first time I saw an episode of Stranger Things. You know, the opening Stranger, Stranger Things is terrific with the music, but then the neon text and logo and title as it's slowly revealed blew my hair back the first time I saw it. This movie has a great opening title reveal. We're going to get into spoiler ter- territory if you haven't seen it yet, so I'm going to spoil the title credit right now. The film opens up with... Technically, the the flashback we find out later on in the film of the cabin sequence with the demon possesses the girl and she rises up from the lake after scalping that one girl <laughs> and killing her and beheading her boyfriend. And then as she floats above the air like a demonic Christ-like figure, the sky above reveals a massive title credits for Evil Dead Rise. It's really cool, beautiful. The music is excellent. And also, you can even see it slightly reflected in the lake below. I thought the the music was excellent. And that title really set up what they were going for with the film in terms of its tone. And it was a really strong opening. I, I really enjoyed it. And I wasn't sure. I was like, because they didn't show anything on in the cabin or at the lake except for her floating up in the air, just that one shot in the trailer. So I was curious. I was like, where is that going to tie into the the apartment? And then eventually we revealed that it was the the bookend of the film. And one of the strengths of the film also, I think, was setting it in a high-rise apartment, something that hadn't been done before in the franchise. We're used to the cabin, so I think they gave us the, the cabin to open it just for a little bit. But I think the changing the location really, for me, enjoying the film absolutely increased its rewatchability and its believability. And having like an isolated location that's in public in a way was even more scary like they're on the 13th floor there are people living in the building they're in the city but they're still trapped and that in a way is even more terrifying yeah they threw in a bunch of stuff but like get out of the woods let's go to the city we'll do something different we'll do a little homage to the cliche trope that Raimi made so popular with the original evil dead of the cabin in the woods, there's always a group of five. This time it's a family of five, and you know, they're rekindling relationships, they have their problems like all families do. 
and setting in the apartment just in a city in general is a lot of fun, as well as throwing in a natural disaster with an earthquake being kind of the catalyst and big event for this demonic presence to be discovered and then released by one of the kids from this family because they're a sick-ass DJ and they can't help <laughs> but like, bro, check out this record I found. Check out this new vinyl I got. Danny, vintage. put the records down. Dude, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> also makes me wary living in LA. <laughs> the earthquake. <laughs> there hasn't been like an intense like, earthquake in a while. Yeah, I haven't, well, I haven't seen any yeah, pavement crack. Did you, there was one, uh, a little rumble last month. There's a little rumble. It's almost like begs the question, did the demonic presence, was it trying to get found? Was it trying to get re- released? Did it create this earthquake? Was it a completely natural accident disaster? Or is the demonic presence just like waiting to get found? Kind of like the ring, how it has to get discovered and it uses some force to eventually get discovered by somebody some being is that why danny couldn't help but go underground and find that bank vault basically i'll set up the the plot of the film this family of five the aunt and sister of ellie aunt of the kids of her kids shows up uh needs some help beth she uh is a guitar tech she found out clearly that she's pregnant from the pregnancy test and she's going home she returns home as a surprise to them to visit them and basically, this earthquake happens, the kids are out getting pizza, and Danny, one of the kids, can't help but be curious about what's underneath the ground as they see this bank vault, discovers this creepy old book, and then these records, they're a DJ, so I'll bring it up, and honestly, Danny, turn the fucking music down. <laughs> if I live with Danny, holy crap, put some headphones on, like, I know you want your kids to, like, be creative and everything, but Jesus Christ. That's you know, loud. You got some neighbors, or maybe they technically don't have neighbors in this building, because yeah, it's so, goddamn, floor. so yeah. goddamn abandoned here. They have four neighbors. And yeah. then this recording reveals and has the, tr- the uh, spell, basically, sayings of these priests that were trying to learn about it in the 1920s, 1923. They discovered the Book of the Dead, and they're like, we got to use this as a tool for good. But the, it's the Book of the Dead. That's what it's called. Get rid of it. That's actually Bruce Campbell's voice. He's one of oh, the great. priests on the record. He's the one that says, destroy it. Uh-huh. It's called the Book of the Dead for a reason. Cast yeah. it into the fire. <laughs> <laughs> That's Bruce Campbell. And then obviously the demon is released and torments this entire family. And I like how it's it was basically choosing which demonic presence would appear, and it was the the that woman d- demon, and I, I can't remember what it was called, but like that was the the one that was chosen in a way out of that entire book of probably demonic entities inside. I think that turning the page, it turning to that page is why that demon was released. Well, also, so that's there's, my guess. There's though. great connections yeah. to lore and the Evil Dead lore in this film. And basically, this book, the Book of the Dead, which is also called the Necromonicon Ex Mortis, is used prevalently throughout the Evil Dead series. And this could mean that there's multiple books of the dead, really. So when Danny plays the record he finds with the Necromonicon, it mentions that this book was one of books of the book's three volumes. This would help incorporate all versions of the Necronomicon we have seen across the original films, the TV series, and the 2013 remake. Realistically, the remake could just be another story set at a different location than the original films, meaning this is all could be in the same cinematic world, which is really so fun. And the overarching detail connecting the entire Evil Dead franchise is this Necromonicon Ex Mortis. And so the cool thing about this version of the book is we got this new kind of monster to the Evil Dead franchise, which reminded me so much (laughs) of the Rat King in in the last episode. Oh my god, the Rat King. And so this Marauder, basically, which is the final evolution of this demon, you could say, is when the family all just gets put together with pieces, three heads, limbs, and legs, and arms everywhere. This giant blob of a demon monster tracking Beth and Cassie at the end of the film. I thought that was so cool. They're like, it's a different volume. Different book, different kinds of demons, different final stage of big bosses. But man, did that thing slow down because of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was actually easier to kill. It was so easy. <laughs> it, like, it was scarier when it was just Ellie, I think. It was scarier when they were, like, because she could run and chase you. But, like, I would just say that monster, it was slow as hell. Slow as hell and also pretty, <laughs> like, just look around the car. <laughs> like, honestly, when they're all, like, around the car, like, how hard could you hide behind the car? <laughs> it's kind of like in Scream 6 when there's two aisles in the convenience store. Yeah, it's yeah. like, they can't, like, hide in a convenience store. How is the first thing you don't do is look underneath the car? Yeah. Like, how is that the, not the first thing you do? Literally, demon, <laughs> just run around the car. <laughs> run around the car real fast. I'm sure you'll find them. I don't think it can run. <laughs> eh, it's, it's like a hurdle. It's yeah. like, it like uh, it's, 
Gallops. Gallops, yeah. <laughs> Gallopanting across the parking lot. Well, it's lot. limbs. It's like it walks on wrists that are broken sideways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's yeah. probably not a fast mover, as you can tell. Yeah. But I like, I like that. the design. Yeah, the design's crazy. It's yeah. insane. Three heads, but it's also just like the victims of this family are all just mashed up together in this demon entity. Danny fucked it up, man. Yeah. <laughs> Danny, <laughs> Danny killed the entire it, family. It was totally your fault, Danny. <laughs> Danny's fault. And everyone's like, Danny, it's not your fault. It's, yeah. it's Danny's Bridget fault. Totally right. Bridget, <laughs> Bridget was totally right. Bridget was right. Danny, it was your fault. Danny, you killed your whole family. <laughs> <laughs> Except for your sister. Oh, Gotta my God. Out of curiosity, Danny, 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 Moving through the force, opening this film. Demon POV. Yeah, the demon POV. But we learned it was a drone. It was a drone's <laughs> POV. I thought it was like a fun twist on that um, on that part of the connecting thread of the franchise. So I thought that that was one of my favorite parts of the film. Just like that clever nod and saying, oh, this is like a new version. This is a contemporary film compared to the others. I think that Cronin did a great job with that because I also thought that was the opening credit roll. Just like the original Evil Dead, like the spirit's been released or it's opening up like that. And I thought it was going to be the demon spirits until later on we get that shot when it comes to the apartment building, which is awesome. It looks so good. But you could tell that second one is so smooth in the way it moves. But then the drone one is kind of like rigid when it turns a little bit. Oh, it yeah. Makes, it makes cuts. So like, like when with it's the turning left and right. And then when you think back about it, it's like, oh, it's like a, a definitely a remote operated machine was doing that because it's like a lot more like harsh in its adjustments. I feel that. Adjustments. I, feel that. I will say this film did not go as hard as I was expecting. I feel like the trailer, it was it got me very excited. I was like gonna see like the most messed up movie I'd seen in a long time. It was actually pretty it was pretty easy to bear. Um I have a pretty good tolerance for gore and blood and anything terrible, but I was just like I was like leaning back, like, oh it's not that bad. It was I was I thought it was gonna go a lot harder. And even you had like no problem watching the film, right? The only thing that I had trouble watching was Bridget chewing the glass. <laughs> Biting when she took that second bite of the glass. That was good, yeah. I was like, okay. Everything else I looked at and I didn't squirm really at all. Yeah. Calvin, you were squirming next to me <laughs> more than I was squirming. Even the cheese grater wasn't bad. Yeah, was... but I wasn't yeah, I didn't get scared. The jump sta- scares didn't get me. Like when the 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 cross of Jesus came like flying yeah, in yeah. the camera, that didn't get me at all. So I was a little surprised how not unscary, but just like I, I wasn't really terrified this whole entire movie. But it's not that to say, to say I didn't love it and yeah. have a great time. I was just expecting to be scared the whole time. Like the black phone, like that was way more terrifying to me than this movie. I think because the trail the trailer was very strong, and the the trailer hinted at it being extremely graphic, and graphic gore is what you m- generally expect from a film like this. And so I think since it wasn't that bad, I was I was like, oh, I guess it, w- I, it was just like not what was advertised in terms of that realm. But what they did do is they went the dark comedy route. They went the campy route, which did work as well, especially with the talking corpses, the eyeball, lots of great references. And so I actually found the film to be actually quite funny. And I, there was one part where I was cackling. It was when it was after the sister Bridget she had become a demon and they killed her, or so they thought they killed her and they tied her up. I thought that was funny when <laughs> she was like tied up and underneath the sheet for like wrapped over like with twenty different things. And then later on, about ten minutes later, the two kids are walking towards camera across the apartment, and then she starts walking behind them, and it, it just reminded me of E. T. covered in a, <laughs> covered in a blanket. It was it made me crack up. It was funny. There are so many great homages to horror and cinema and the Evil Dead franchise. In this film, and I put together a pretty solid list I would love Let's to go through. So, obviously, the flying demon POV is a reference to all the evil deads, basically, as well as, you know, the flying demon spirit once it gets released. The shining elevator doors of blood, I thought that was terrific, and that was combined with the evil dead trope of just so much blood out of nowhere. Like, where is this blood coming from? Whether it's blood in this elevator or, like, raining blood in 2013 it's just this elevator getting full of so much goddamn blood was awesome. But then the reference to the shining of the elevator elevator doors opening and blood pouring out, I thought that was maybe my favorite part of the entire movie. And what I like about it is it was quick. It wasn't like, let's copy the shot, let's do it super slow-mo, let's open those elevator doors nice and gently and just slowly get this blood pouring out. They did it in like four seconds of them pouring out of it. It was really fast, and I think that's the perfect amount of time for a reference like that. What else we got? Let's see. We have this is bringing back the Evil Dead franchise to New Line Cinema, which produced this film with Warner Brothers and distributed it. And they distributed the films 
original theatrical release in 1983. New Line Cinema, we all know, famously also did the Lord of the Rings trilogy. A Nightmare on Elm Street is referenced in this film as the next door kids are knocking on the door trying to get Bridget to come watch a Nightmare on Elm Street marathon with them. Covering Cheetos. <laughs> Covering Cheetos. <laughs> like Anthony said, the eyeball landing in one of those kids' mouths and choking them to death is a reference to Evil Dead 2 where an eyeball lands in a woman's mouth. The Evil Tree was upgraded to basically elevator cables when it first possessed Ellie and, and trapped her in the air, just like the tree branches in the original Evil Dead. We also have Dead by Dawn, the quote that the demon says, as well as Swallow Your Soul. Dead Those are references dawn. to Evil Dead 2. Dead by Dawn. Dead by Dawn. Come get some is a reference to Army of Darkness. That's something that Ash says. The wood chipper is a reference to Fargo. Actually, remember the end of that film? Oh, yeah. With the e foot in the air. <laughs> <laughs> in Evil Dead 2, the Kendarian demon was unleashed after Ash played a recording made by Professor Nobi reciting an incantation over a tape recorder. Evil Dead Rises demon is similarly released when Dan plays the same incantation recited by the priests on a vinyl record player. Listen, priests, whenever you find some evil incantation, just don't record it. Just in case. Just to, just for safety. Just safety. Just, just for safety. Just stop recording just it. Just for the safety of humanity. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, one of the priests on the vinyl is actually Bruce Campbell. In the first of the three recordings Danny plays, Bruce can be heard saying, Destroy it! It's called the Book of the Dead for a Raisin! Love it. Love Maggots it. is referenced, obviously, from the trailer where Ellie says as she's possessed, Mommy's with the magnets, maggots now. Bridget also vomits maggots upon turning into a deadite. With Evil Dead Rises Maggot's detail coming being a callback to the original movie's ending, at the end of the Evil Dead, Ash burns the Necronomicon, leading the Deadites to rapidly decay in a manner that maggots crawl out of their decomposing bodies. Obviously, the end of the film, before Beth and Cassie walks a walk away, she looks at the chainsaw and picks that bad boy up, and so basically she's been handed the baton, you could say. Setting up some sequels. <laughs> Maybe we'll get her and Levi together. Now, every Evil Dead movie and every Sam Raimi film features an Easter egg related to the original, which is the Oldsmobile Delta 88 car, that yellow old school car. It's iconic, and it's driven by Ash Williams in the first film. However, Evil Dead Rise breaks this tradition by not featuring the actual car. Instead, Cronin, he said this via, via Bloody Disgusting, revealed that Beth's yellow chainsaw was designed to match the exact color of Ash's car, thus satisfying the Delta 88 Easter egg requirements. You've seen it in a bunch of other movies. It's in Drag Me to Hell. It's in Spider-Man 1 and 2. It's actually Uncle Ben's car in Spider-Man. So Sam Raimi loves putting this in his movies as Easter eggs. Evil Dead's Rise main characters, like I said, consists of a family of five, Beth, Ellie, Danny, Bridget, and Cassie, which is a familiar character setup for the entire franchise. In The Evil Dead in 1981, that features five characters, Ash, Cheryl, Scott, Linda, and Shelley. The Evil Dead in 2013 followed suit with five characters set up, Mia, David, Eric, Olivia, and Natalie. However, Evil Dead Rise marks the first time that more than one character from the original five survives because we have both Beth and Cassie survive. Cassie's too cute. You can't kill her. Yeah, you can't, that would have been bad. You can't turn Cassie into a demon monster with the other three. The other, the other kids, they're, they're probably adult actors. I honestly felt so bad for the family because it was a family. You know yeah, what I mean? It wasn't just a bunch of teens. I was like, this is terrible. That adds that, to it that so much. That poor family. And Fucking then, Danny. <laughs> what else do we have? Oh, another great nod to Sam Raimi and his Evil Dead franchise is the frequent sound of buzzing flies. You heard this a few times, especially in the opening five minutes, but it's a lot more prevalent throughout the film if you watch it again a second time. And that's obviously a reference to Sam Raimi's Evil Dead films. And it's just terrifying and it sets the mood so well. And it had uh, some really terrific sequences that you hadn't seen before in these films and one of my favorite sequences was the the POV of the what do you call it the in the door the hole the peephole the keyhole I mean not the keyhole the but peephole. peephole yeah the peephole on the door and seeing quite a lot of action play out through that like fisheye lens and I really love that and you got to see some great gore that kid got his arms ripped off <laughs> and then just basically the the neighbors being terrorized by the demon I really like how much uh, Cronin used that shot. Because it's very simple, but it's very effective. You can actually do quite a lot of long takes with it. 
And it was just very fun to see ac- action played out with that. It was really terrific. Kind of like Scooby-Doo, Scooby-Doo style going left and right across the mm-hmm. screen, which is a lot of fun. But yeah, that, that was terrifying. But that was maybe my, my favorite shot set up in the entire film. Yeah, I thought it was really refreshing and just exciting visually to see that. So he knocked it out of the park with that one. It was very cool. And Ellie d- decimating everybody in that <laughs> hallway was great. And I thought it was fun because... It was a quick way to kill everybody in the hallway. Yeah. And just show it from a unique point of view. And also, I mean, this movie, you have kids being killed. I mean, those kids were young. And that's something I hadn't seen the Evil Dead do before, having, like, children being murdered by the demon, which I think is much more impactful than just teens. Yeah, it's tough to do that to kids. Although it's, like, through the fisheye people, yeah. so it's kind of hard to see. The mm-hmm. one who gets choked, he's probably an 18-year-old actor, 19-year-old actor, yeah. but the other kid who gets slammed against the wall with no <laughs> arms, that was, like, a 12-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> and I will say, probably my favorite bit of gore was her biting the eye out of the guy. Oh, I thought man. that was great. That was brutal that was stuff, really fantastic. man. Yeah. Brutal stuff. I had some some really favorite parts about this film that I made a list of, in addition to the opening title role. Again, Alyssa Sutherland as Ellie was fantastic. She was really the key to this film working so well. Terrifying performance. And not not just the how she spoke, but like her entire physicality was just phenomenal and really just solidified her status as being like a future screen screen queen, I think. I mean, I want to see her more things now. She just was dynamite on screen. That creepy smile that oh she could God. do. Holy crap. Holy crap. I loved the, like the zombie demon family and the zombies <laughs> kind of all coming to life after they were killed to come chase after them in the in the elevator and dead by dawn. I thought that was so creepy. The chainsaw to the head at the end was absolutely awesome. Just like that wide shot of her just like stabbing it down and just working so hard to get it through. But then like the heads are still alive. And yeah, yeah. It's not until you completely just separate all their parts that you kill or they think they killed the demon. The, the Marauder, again, this crazy demon monster of body parts was so crazy to see. The cheese grater, we all knew it was coming. We were talking about it before the movie t- and teased in the trailer. Wasn't as hard to watch as I thought, but it still looked really painful. Yeah, because it was a very fast shot, and it was CGI. So I think if they lingered on it longer and actually did it practically, it would have been really fucked up. And the thing is, it's a cheese grater, so yeah. like just the idea of it being used as a weapon is terrifying. Like It's even in Tenet, and when I see all that in Tenet every time, I'm like, oh, that looks like it hurts. The whole audience gasped in, uh, simultaneously when the cheese grater was uh, grabbed. It was and great. Again, one of my most favorite parts is just the amount of blood in this film. It takes a while to get there, but once we get cooking and once we get rolling... There is so much blood, especially, obviously, that elevator sequence, but also in the parking garage structure. Now, director Lee Cronin stated in an interview that 6,500 liters or 1,720 gallons of fake blood were used for this movie. This episode is, of course, sponsored by our great friends at MoviePosters.com, the number one place to get your posters online today. Be sure to use our promo code Raiders10 to get 10% off your order today. They have a gigantic library of pretty much every movie and TV show imaginable in their poster arsenal, so be sure to head over there for all of your poster needs and use our promo code RAIDERS10. Again, that's RAIDERS10 at MoviePosters.com and get 10% off your order today. I will say the one thing that I was hoping would be in the film was the tattoo gun in the eyeball. Ooh, it's close. So it was. it ended up being uh, she's bringing the... The needle down, the, sh- the vibrating needle down uh, on in front of Bridget's eye, and at the last second she turns away. So it almost got her eye. I was like, when they turned away, I was like, no, I wanted to see that. That says how messed up we are as <laughs> film goers. But like, <laughs> that was one thing that, like, if that happened, that would have been really messed up. That would have been disgusting. That yeah. would have been like hostile. That would have been terrifying. Yeah, that's disgusting. Oh, I forgot about Stephanie. Oh, so Stephanie. Cassie's Stephanie. Little, Cassie's little staff that she cut off a baby doll's head and put on top of as Stephanie. Ends up saving her temporarily from Bridget, and I, I thought that was really cute and funny. Yeah, it, she reminded me of, what's his name from Toy Story, Max? The kid with all the dolls. He's that the he, next-door neighbor yeah, from Toy Story? Yeah, <laughs> cuts off the heads of dolls and stuff. I think it's Max. Yeah, I think it's Max. That's what she reminded me of with her toy that she was beheading in the opening of the movie. Or is it something with an S? X? Ash? No, I think it's Max. Let me double-check. It's Sid. Sid. Oh my God, it's Sid. Sid. I knew it was yeah. something with an S. Man, way off. I was. I was way you off. Were way off, man. <laughs> <laughs> Samsonite. <laughs> There's some great foreshadowing in this too, where like you're expecting it to happen. Like as soon as that neighbor says that he's got a gun, you're like, you know, it's gonna be like a shotgun, like mm-hmm. a double barrel. He pulls it out. You're like, here we go. As well as him foreshadowing that he's got a truck downstairs full of tools. He's got a chainsaw. 
and the wood chipper, and you know that those are going to get busted out at some point, probably by Beth. Well, we knew the chainsaw on Beth was going to happen because yeah. of the posters and the yeah. trailer. That was like one of the most important images. And what I like about this is they kind of tied to 2013's Evil Dead, where the final girl, she is basically just covered in blood at the end of the film, and it's raining blood. In, the, in this one, it's from the wood chipper, and she's just getting poured with blood. I also, got, I also felt like a callback to The Descent. Of the girls cover absolutely just caked in blood. It reminded me of that for sure. Absolutely. And the, the makeup team did a phenomenal job. The special effects, visual effects teams were so just standouts and really made the film work without a doubt. And uh, I think every the, the entire crew was just so talented on this. And I really enjoyed the music as well. The, com- the composer did a phenomenal job. It does not look like a $12 million movie. Twelve million was yeah. the budget. Wow! It looks like it was wow. way more expensive. Yeah, so they did a terrific was... job in this production. There are still some mysteries and lingering questions for for audiences at, after this film. So, one of my favorite mysteries for this film is what's the next part of the cabin? Is this like a setup for how like the Evil Dead is, where the demons down in the basement once they you know release it and. And is this kind of like, is that demon going to be waiting for them? Well, they put the demon down there. But, like, is the demon going to be waiting for them? The next people that come to this cabin mm-hmm. in the woods? And is it just going to chill? Is it going to go out in the world? I think go out in the world and explore. Because explore. it ends and we see, like, really what happened. And how, well, we see how Jessica got possessed by the demon yeah. in the parking garage. And then the film obviously opens up with what happens to them. <laughs> Just crazy. That girl gets scalped, which was nuts. <laughs> um, so I'm curious, like, what's going to happen with the possessed demon? Maybe they will do a complete film at the cabin where people go to the cabin for vacation and she's there. Well, did the demon clean it up? Well, let's see. <laughs> so, well, because actually, she so, ripped the scalp in the bedroom. Yeah, yeah, so that's the only blood. She probably just got some Windex and like a mop. <laughs> probably set up like an Airbnb account. <laughs> <laughs> a dead eye with an Airbnb. Yeah. That's great. It's <laughs> pretty smart. That's great. <laughs> well, I would think something that would be interesting is really going bigger in scope with the Evil Dead film. If, do, if they do another one and just really spreading deadites across an entire city, sounds very interesting. Like, that would be really fun to see if you gave them like a. 50 60 million dollar budget they could really put a lot into the production and make it a really big in scope film because i think that that could perform really well if you have like tons of deadites not just one or two but like a city full of them that sounds really fun yeah it's like a new zombie movie yeah. that'd be intense or they could even i'm sure they're gonna talk about evil dead verse like every franchise every ip is getting a verse so they definitely set this up for a verse for the Evil Dead. Clearly, you can follow Beth and Cassie's story going forward. And obviously, Beth is pregnant. If she's going to keep that baby, then she's going to have a family of her own, you know? And then follow her story. Maybe get uh, Jane Levy's character from the from 2013's version in there. And, like, combine them. That would be pretty cool. You could even do a prequel. What was it like when the priests unleashed the demon in 1923 and did the recordings oh, yeah. and then tried to dismember the demon that they talked about on the records and like did everything they could and buried them alive and lit them on fire and they danced in the flames like that would be pretty cool and like who set up the vault who's who put that bank sized vault underneath the underneath, underground sounds like james wants some origin stories I'm just Origins. Saying, they clearly set it up for i think that's what a lot of these ips are doing they're leaving these nuggets in there different time periods different characters that you could explore in the future what could be cool also is an older time period. Period piece, you could even maybe say it during the Salem witch trials and have uh, a, a village think that a deadite is a witch and then it's them battling the deadite. So in the 19th century? Yeah. No, no, in the 17th century. 17th century. What Salem witch trials. What? So, so do evil dead in Salem. Salem witch trials in the 1600s? Salem witch trials, yeah. No, that was in the 1600s? Yeah. Oh, I thought that was like 1800. No, no, that was a long time ago. That was early days, man. Salem, was... <laughs> let me double check. Witch trials. That wasn't like 1940s? <laughs> 1600 seems pretty early. No, it was happening. 1692? Yeah, man. Whoa! It was, happening, it was actually happening in Europe before America, so it was happening uh, for many of the 1600s. Yeah, the Salem witch trials happened a long time ago. I don't know how no one's been able to make a good Salem Witch Trials movie or, or Well, The Crucible's yet. good. Okay, true. Crucible's great. But you could do a really cool horror movie with Salem Witch Trials. Also, The Witch is basically kind of like... It has the, the history of the Salem Witch Trials, you know? Pe- the, that is the hysteria happening within the family of the witch being there. So that is a Salem Witch... It essentially is a, a Salem Witch Trials movie. Over 200 people were killed during the Salem Witch Trials. Just in America. That's insane. It was happening in Europe as well. It was happening all across Europe. 
It's, it all started in Europe, and then it was that fear was and hysteria was spread to America. True. I do have a question about how people get possessed by the demon. Uh-huh. Now, they explain. Obviously, Ellie's is obvious. She's the original, and the demon POV captures her in the elevator. Yeah, yeah, propped yeah, up. yeah. That's obvious. Bridget gets possessed. Clearly, it seems from the cut in the wound from the tattoo. The gun, lick. The lick. Ellie licks her wound. She oh, says, she she says Mo- let mommy kiss it better, and she licks her wound. Gotcha. All right. Yeah. So, because because then I was going to say, because Bridget and, I mean, Beth and Cassie both get wounded by the demon. Okay, so it's the licking of the wound that yeah. passes the possession. So my question is, how did Danny get possessed then? Because Danny was stabbed in with the kitchen knife twice, once in the arm, and then Bridget stabbed Danny in the chest. Then, I can't remember exactly how... Danny got possessed with the deadites. Maybe, well, Danny. Maybe I missed something. Danny dies in the hallway or in the living room. Danny's part of the big monster at the end. No, I know, I know. Yeah. But then, when she, no, when Danny, when Danny dies in the where, kitchen, where is he? In the in the kitchen. He's in the kitchen. So he gets stabbed in the arm and then in the chest. Dies like in their arms, basically. Or, or I'm trying to remember. And then Danny lights Bridget on fire. Yeah. And then. They then die on the then floor. dies on the floor. Yeah, maybe this the like the incantation because there's a dead body around. Because technically the others weren't like changed into demons. Yeah, you could argue the guy with the gun, the guy who gets his eye bit out. Sure, the the the. No, you have a good possessed. point because if they're saying it's spreading of like kind of like spreading of like especially with the blood, if the blood gets in your blood, kind of thing, then because Cassie and Beth got tons of blood exposed on them, so. Why didn't they turn? Especially at the end. Yeah. <laughs> Covered in so blood. So I understand what you're saying because I also was like, why Why didn't they turn but the others turn? You could also you argue. You have to die? Yeah. Well, I, I don't know if you have to die because Bridget didn't die when you're she right, turned. Yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's one of those things where is there an exact way for you to become possessed? You could even argue that the end with Beth and Cassie walking away is a sense of false hope for the audience where like, yeah, you think it's a happy ending, but they're going to get turned anyways. Maybe yeah. they spread it in the city. Who knows? But... I'm curious if there's like an exact ex- explanation of how the demon possession spreads amongst people. Yeah, if you know, let seems, us know. It seems yeah. a little not. I don't want to say the word inconsistent, but kind of a little bit unclear. A, a little unclear in the movie. Unclear. Yeah, I'm trying to figure it out because Danny definitely dies not from on the floor on the after floor. lighting Bridget on fire. But that's yeah. a great point that Beth and Cassie are covered in blood as well as having wounds. You could argue that Beth taped up her wounds so the blood doesn't get exposed, but she is covered and drenched in yeah, blood. Yeah, in your pores. It's bro. definitely in, it's her, in, your pores. It's in her mouth for yeah. sure. <laughs> Ain't it's no everywhere. way she didn't swallow a little blood. Yeah, it's a little in your eye. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> so I think that. But it's not, it's not like it's a, a big con to the movie at all. It just was a little unclear. Yeah, I mean, I don't really have any cons besides just. The, I think it's just funny that the records. The last one says, don't play the records, the basically. Seventh the seventh like, one. I was like, why not label that the first one? Or just kill, <laughs> break the records. Yeah, so when that happened, I was like, why would they put the warning for the seventh vinyl? Like, <laughs> It's just one of those funny horror movie things. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. I mean, it's a reference, again, to the tape recording that Ash plays. Like, why make a recording if, if it's going to possess yeah. somebody else? But yeah. the people, I guess, when they're making it, don't realize that someone's going to find these, maybe, or, or that someone will use them. As the, or they think they they'll think they'll survive, I guess. <laughs> well, I just label it as number one then. <laughs> Don't play these records. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty funny. Um, <laughs> and then just one more con for me personally. <laughs> personally, which you see a lot in Hollywood these days. All men are trash. All men are trash. Every all men are trash. And even if you're a decent guy, you're either. Religious, which is a negative thing in Hollywood. I'm not yeah, saying yeah. it's a negative thing at all, but like, so the Something, guy. It's laughed at in the movie. Yeah, it's laughed yeah. at in the movie, and it was a joke where uh, yeah. the guy asked to pray, and yeah. everyone was like, oh, this is. Like, even the characters are like, are you ridiculous? She's not religious. So like, let the guy pray. So you're either religious or you're like a gun touting guy. And like, <laughs> oh, yeah, I got a gun. So, like, even though those two are good guys, they're trying to help them. Or you have Cheetos all over your yeah, face. So, this poor <laughs> kid, he's just like, has a crush on Bridget. You want to come watch Nightmare on Elm Street? Just covered in Cheetos like Michael Scott. And, yeah, it's like, come on. And obviously, the guy in the opening, like, who's like, oh, I'm going to cut your face up with the drone and, like, oh, my stupid girlfriend. Oh, like, yeah, the boyfriend. I'm like, no oh, one talks God. like this. <laughs> Can we just get one normal guy in a movie? Not anymore, man. Not, not we anymore. Had a good, we had a good run. We had a good run. We had a good like, run. God it's damn, over. It's, it's over. over. <laughs> like, 
all men are trash in horror <laughs> movies. <laughs> there, was, there was another one, like a, I can't remember what movie it was. We were talking about this. I think when Becca came on for for an episode, it was um, Megan. Yeah, all men are trash. Yeah, like, same kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> it is what it is. But yeah, just get one. The 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 baby daddy left. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. The dad's gone. He's a piece. Of, he thinks being a dad's like from distance and just paying child support. <laughs> and I'm sure that El, that Beth's baby daddy is a piece of shit. Probably, <laughs> probably a piece of shit. Probably like a like a singer in a band. <laughs> oh my god, it's so funny. So you know, it's, the thing is, I'm fine with it, but it is getting repetitive. It's just too much. It's getting really repetitive, and it's honestly getting pretty boring. You just see the same archetypes, the same characters over and over again, and it's just getting really boring to see in, in movies. It's like, okay, here we go again. It takes me yeah. out of it. I, like, I love the opening so much, yeah. and I thought it was really cool, but like hearing the guy say, like, oh, just cut your face up a bit, and my <laughs> stupid girlfriend's sick. I'm going <laughs> to drug her up. Ugh. What's up with my girlfriend? Do something about it. Who the fuck talks like that? <laughs> I've never know, met man. anyone like that before. I don't know, man. I'm sure there are guys like that, yeah. but like, just put like a normal dude in there. Yeah, in yeah it's just it's just getting really redundant Like, now. oh, man, I'm really yeah. worried about my girlfriend. I hope she's Why okay. Can't, yeah, you <laughs> <laughs> you used to at least throw one decent guy in there. <laughs> just, I don't know. We'll just Hello, have to make Laura. our own horror movie. No, they don't want to make it. <laughs> you need some more shitty guys in your movie. <laughs> it's okay. We got John Wick, man. Yeah, we got yeah, we got John Wick. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We had, we had a good run. Insidious looks cool. Yeah. But th- that was the cool thing about this movie is seeing all the horror movie trailers coming out. And we have a great run this year coming out. We have The Insidious, The Red Door looks awesome. Patrick mm-hmm. Wilson directing that is his directorial debut. Talk to Me from A24 looks really cool as well. Mm-hmm. In addition to Boogeyman, I haven't seen a trailer for that yet. That looks fucking sick. Yeah, the Boogeyman looks interesting. Very interesting. So I think we're going to have a great year for horror just like last year. It'll oh, be tough yeah. to beat last year because we had some bangers, dude. Some it was a good year bangers. last year. Lots of it original was. content. Yeah. Uh, but I'm excited about the the rest of horror this year, and I'm sure there's some others that I'm, that I'm leaving out, but... Overall, I, I enjoyed this film. Everyone had a really good time. It was so cool. Again, if you came out to the screening, we appreciate it so much. All like what, like fifteen of you? It was so fun. It was a blast. We we hung out afterwards, had a couple of drinks. Thanks for showing up. We're definitely gonna try to do this more often. Like get a bunch of crew together just to go see a movie. I think we can do it for like Mission Impossible or Oppenheimer. Get like a huge Raiders screening going. Maybe we can figure oh, something yeah. out. Is MI Seven coming out in June? June, I believe, because I don't think it's the same month. Oppenheimer's July 21st. July 21st with yeah. Barbie. I think, uh, yeah, I think MI7 is in June, like it's middle of June. It's got to be. So let, me, let me double check. Yeah. So that's going to be June, July 14th, actually, the week before Oppenheimer. What? Is, Whoa. What? July is going to be insane. MI7, Barbie, and Oppenheimer all within a week? That's Holy crazy. crap. That's crazy. Jesus. They're going to be like eating each other's pie the whole time. Yeah, but man, people are gonna love it. Yeah, it's a lot of there's a lot of money to share. That's a lot of box office that's gonna be spread out. Well, you know, Mission Impossible is probably gonna pull like five hundred mil in those ten days. Easy. Yeah, I expect it to do really well. I expect it to pull like I, I wouldn't be surprised if it breaks two fifty opening weekend. Globally. Globally? Will not, will not will not be surprised. That would be easy. No that's, problemo. That's easy. People are hot for Tom right now. For I'm Tom curious Tom. about a hundred mil opening weekend for MI seven. That's what I'm curious about. Domestic. Domestic? Fuck yeah, dude. We'll see. You know, like, people saw Top Gun Maverick over and over again. Me included. Like, everyone's yeah. like, Tom, back in theaters? Let's, Let's go. go. Come on. All right. Uh, you got anything I else? We <laughs> mentioned Tom Cruise for fucking two minutes in an Evil Dead episode. <laughs> you know we how, can't help ourselves. You know how it happens. <laughs> <laughs> but the movie was, uh, it was a lot of fun. And if you're not sure about seeing a movie that might scare the hell out of you or be really gross, this actually isn't even that that bad. It's pretty tame. Well, they probably would have already seen it because they listened to us spoil the whole thing. Some people listen to the whole episode spoiling. No, that's true. Yeah, that's true. But I enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun. It was funnier than I thought. Not as scary as I thought, but they made up for it in blood. It was a good sure. time. It was a good time. Good time at the cinema. Thank yeah. you so much for tuning in to our review of Evil Dead Rise. Evil dies tonight. Evil, Evil dies rises tonight. tonight. <laughs> Evil rises tonight. <laughs> See you no, next. That'll be for The Exorcist. <laughs> yeah. Oh my the God. The Exorcist rises tonight. <laughs> Exorcist rises tonight. David Gordon Green rises tonight. <laughs> I swear to God. All right. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Have a great week. More episodes this week. Obviously, become a patron today at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Get two bonus episodes every week. Five different tiers of membership. Thanks for tuning in and appreciate your support around the world. See you next time. This episode was executive produced by our chosen one patrons, Cody Moen, Andrew Hagen, Becca Keen, Benjamin Cook, Calvin Murphy Griggs, Nicholas Martin, Darian, Tyler McFly, and Sal Coching.
Our Chosen One patrons are our biggest supporters. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching Raiders of the Lost podcast. Be sure to hit that subscribe button, hit the like button as well, notifications for sure. Listen to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, everywhere you can listen to podcasts. And be sure to check out this other content we have on our YouTube channel.